Now, this Bible, this book that we're going to be considering this evening, has been in existence for thousands of years. And one third of this book is prophecy. And the Bible makes a lot of claims. Now, here's one claim that it makes, and something that I'd like to consider with you for a couple of moments. If you would, turn with me to a book in the New Testament, the second of Peter. And we read these words with respect to a claim that the Bible makes. So we're looking at the second letter of Peter, and we're looking at chapter 1. We're going to focus our attention for a minute or two on verses 19 through 21. 2,000 or thousands of years this book has been in existence. One third of its content is prophecy. Now listen to what Peter says in verse 19 of the second of Peter chapter 1. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed in your hearts. Now I've left out a couple of little lines there which should be in parentheses. So Peter says we have a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well to take heed in your hearts. Take these words, Peter says, and make them part of you. Then he goes and says in verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture or of the Bible is of any private origin, which the word interpretation means. So nobody can say, oh, I dreamed this up, or I wrote this as I felt the need to put it down. No, no, Peter says, all of the scripture that's written is of no private origin. For in verse 21, the prophecy of the Bible came not in times past by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the power of God, by God's spirit, by God's power. So you can see Peter places an enormous value on Bible prophecy. He said, it's written that you might take heed in your hearts. Its origin is from God, not men. And the Bible throws down a very wonderful challenge, but also a wonderful invitation. And the Bible says this, and this is the challenge to you this evening. I'm quoting from Proverbs 25 and verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honour of kings is to search out a matter. And of course, this was written in Hebrew, the Old Testament. And the word glory and the word honour are both the same Hebrew words. But what I want to particularly focus on is there are two other words in this verse that are exactly the same Hebrew word. And those two words are the word thing and the word matter. Now listen to this. The proverb says this, it is the glory of God to conceal a word, but the honour of kings is to search out the word. So here's a Bible, one third of which is prophecy. And God lays the challenge and the invitation and he says, I have written this book in such a way that you just can't pick it up and say, oh yeah, yeah, I, I get that. I I've read that once, that's all I need. No. God writes it in such a way that it takes effort, it takes energy, it takes activity that we might search and search and search to understand the meaning that God has couched for those that would diligently search the meaning of his purpose and his word. And therefore, God challenges you and me, I've written my word. It didn't come by the origins of men. All prophecy is given by God. He said, therefore, search it out, and the honour of kings will rest upon you. All right, let's begin the search in the context of Bible prophecy, proving that the Bible is the word of God. Now, there are thousands of Bible prophecies, small and large, enormous, some of them. And one of the greatest prophecies to show to us that the Bible is, in fact, the word of God, are prophecies to do with Israel. 
And we want to explore taking up that challenge out of Proverbs. It is the glory of God to conceal his word in such a way that energy and effort is required. We want to search out what God has to say about this nation in the context of Bible prophecy. Now, to do so, we want to start our address this evening and show you the importance that Israel is placed in the Bible. The first one is that Israel, we're told in the prophet Isaiah, Israel is God's witness. Now, I want you to come with me, if you will, to Isaiah and chapter 43. Have a look at the importance of the nation of Israel. So here we are in Isaiah and chapter 43. And we read the importance that God places on the nation of Israel. So we'll pick up Isaiah 43 and we'll have a look at verse 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, you are mine. So God's very emphatic about the nation of Israel. God says, you are mine. Well, he then challenges the nations because he says in verse 10 of Isaiah 43, you, Israel, are my witnesses. So all the nations of the world, the population of the world, are challenged by God to say, when you look at Israel, you are looking at my witness that I exist and the book called the Bible is in fact God's word. You, God says to Israel, are my witnesses. And my servant, verse 10, continuing on, whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. That's a very high position to be in as far as a nation is concerned. You are mine, you are my witnesses. Now, that's how important Israel is to God and the Bible. But have a look at a, a New Testament quotation with respect to the importance of Israel. And you'll see with these two quotations, one in the Old and one in the New Testament, why prophecies concerning Israel are so important to us. Let's go and have a look at now at Acts chapter 28. So God challenges the nations to see the existence of the nation of Israel and say, they're a witness that I exist. Well, there was a man called the Apostle Paul who wrote a lot of the New Testament. And he was a man that was chosen to take the gospel to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. He was put in prison for his belief and his hope. And when you come to Acts 28, you see the hope that this man had and the hope that he had caused him to be cast into prison and to be bound with chains. Now, picking up the record in Acts 28 and verse 16. And when he came to Rome, Paul, the centurion delivered the prisoners of the captain to the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. And it came to pass that after these three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said to them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem unto the, into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, they would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was constrained to appeal to Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. Then Paul says, the reason I've been dragged here, the reason I've been accused, in verse 20, for this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel, the hope of Israel, am I bound with this chain. So back in Isaiah 43, God says, you are mine, Israel. You are my witnesses, Israel. And here's a man that's preaching the gospel to all the Gentiles. And he says, I am bound with this chain because I believe in the hope of Israel. So Israel is very, very 
important in the word of God. And there are remarkable prophecies about this nation that leaves us in no doubt whatever we hold in our hands this evening, the word of God. Let's continue and let's explore some of the amazing prophecies with respect to this nation. Why is Israel God's witness? Why was Paul's hope the hope of Israel? Because way, way back in the very beginning of this nation's foundation, we see God's purpose with the, world, with the nation of Israel. Now, I want to go back 4,000 years and start our journey here and follow some remarkable prophecies about this nation, leaving us in no doubt about this book being God's word. We go back 4,000 years or thereabouts, and we're right in the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis 11 and verse 31. Just for a couple of minutes, follow a couple of quotations with respect to how this all began and then look at some prophecies that God gave uh, concerning this nation. Coming back to the very beginning, the first book of the Bible, why is Israel God's witness? Why is Israel Paul's hope? The man chosen to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Well, Genesis chapter 11. And we read these words. And we'll follow the story on this map. Now here we are, you see we've got a, a couple of red dots there. That one down here, or just here. We find ourselves in Babylon, the top of the Persian Gulf. And here we are in Genesis chapter 11 and we read in verse 31. What's happening here? What's happening on this map? Well, verse 31, Genesis 11. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, now, here's the issue. And they went forth with them from Ur. Ur of the Chaldees. So we pick up the story where they're leaving this place, this family. Where are they going? Where they're going to go from Ur of the Chaldees, from Babylon, and they're going to go up to this place called Haran. You read that. They left Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, or they're eventually heading there. They're going to the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, as we know today. But as they leave Ur, they're going to journey up here first, as the record says. And they came to Haran. There's Haran there. They leave Ur, they go to Haran, and they're on their way to Canaan. Now, that's a journey of faith. God said to Abraham, go. And he didn't know where he was going. Leave your past life. Leave a life of darkness. Leave a life of idolatry. Go. It's a journey of faith. When they came to Haran, God then visited them through words and God said this in Genesis chapter 12 and we're reading now verses 1 to 3. He left Ur in faith. Now God gives him a promise because of the faith that he showed by believing God and following his words. Now you pick up the record in verses 1 through 3 of Genesis 12. And the Lord said to Abraham, now he's in Haran now, Get out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, into a land that I will show you. In other words, Abraham, I want you to come here, but I'm going to show you. You don't know yet. Get out of there and come into a land that I will show thee. If you do that, here are four promises. It's a promise of faith. Promise one, I will make of you, Abraham, a great nation. That's promise one. The second promise, I will bless you, Abraham, and I'll make your name great. The third promise, verse three, I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. And the fourth promise, in you, Abraham, shall all the nations, your Bible says families, all the nations of the world shall be blessed. So while Abraham is there, God says, I want you to move from there and come down into a land that I will show you. Do that and I'll make of you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll bless those that bless you and I'll make all nations blessed in Abraham. This man takes a very, very high profile in God's word. Well, Abraham left. He walked in a journey of faith and he came down 
in around 2066 BC, 2,000 years before Christ, 4,000 years ago, he came into this land. And when he got there, Abraham had a family. He had a son called Isaac. And Isaac had a son called Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. So the nation of Israel came from that man who came from there and who went there and came down to there. Abraham became the father of the nation of Israel. And God said to Abraham when he left there, I'm going to make of you, Abraham, a great nation. Well, there's the emergence of the nation of Israel. Well, they lived in the land of Canaan for a number of years. Circumstances came about whereby there was a famine in the land. And Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, was caused to move down and to live in Egypt where there was food. And this nation, this fledging nation of Israel, lived in Egypt for around 200 years. And they had to get out. Because as the 200 years transpired, the Egyptians began to put the Israelites into slavery. And God called a man by the name of Moses to deliver Israel out of Egypt. And they left Egypt in 1626 BC and they're on their way to the promised land, the land that originally Abraham came to when he left Babylon, came to Haran and came down there. Now... Hundreds of years have transpired and now the Jews have left the bondage and slavery of Egypt under the hand of Moses and they come there into the area of Sinai and they're journeying toward the promised land. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when they are there, there in Sinai, God comes, comes to Israel and delivers a prophecy, a prophecy about this nation. Come with me, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter 7, and we read these words. They're at Sinai. They haven't got into the promised land yet. They're on their way. And while they're at Sinai, God delivers us. Having led them out of Egypt, they've seen the wonder and miracle of God's power. But like a lot of human nature... This is what happens. Deuteronomy chapter 7, reading verses 6 through 8. There is where they are when these words are delivered. Verse 6. God says to Israel, For you are a holy people unto the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a special people unto himself. We read of that in Isaiah 43. You're mine. You're my witnesses. Well, here's God saying to this, way, way, way before Isaiah said those words in Isaiah 43. Here's God saying, you're a chosen people. You're special. Why? What was so good about Israel? Well, God says this, uh, I chose you not because you were great in number. You were fewer than all people at the end of verse 7. I didn't choose you because you were a great people. Verse 8 but because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the promise which he hath sworn unto your fathers. Oh, the promise. God said to Abraham when he was in Haran, get out. If you do that, I'll make of you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll bless those that bless you. And in you, Abraham, shall all the world be blessed. Here's God saying this to them. Now there, they're at Sinai. Hundreds of years later. And God said, I haven't chosen you because you're a great number. I've chosen you because I love you and because of the promises that I made. Verse 8, we read that again. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the promise or the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand. I've redeemed you from Egypt. I've redeemed you out of the bondman. I've redeemed you from the hand of Pharaoh. God says, I love you. And Israel, when they were at Sinai, when they were in the wilderness, 
turned their back on God. They turned their back on God's love. They turned their back on the promises that God had made. And because of that, this is a prophecy that God gave, chilling prophecy that God gave to this nation. Deuteronomy 28. They're still at Sinai. They still haven't got into the promised land yet. God says, I love you. I've chosen you. You're special. I made promises. But they turned their back on him. They rebelled against God. And because they rebelled against God, this is the chilling promise God made about Israel. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 63. There they are. They're at Sinai. They're in the wilderness. They haven't got into the promised land yet. Not there yet. And these are the words God delivered to them. Verse 63, Deuteronomy 28. It shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you, and we saw that in chapter 7. I love you. I've chosen you. You're special. As God rejoiced over you to do good to you and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you, to bring you to naught. And you shall be plucked from off the land whither you goest to possess. They're not even there. They're at Sinai. They're not even in the promised land. And God says, when you go to possess the land, which you will, when you get there, I'm going to pluck you off the land. You're going to be punished. Chilling words. And then he says in verse 64, and the Lord shall scatter you among all people from one end of the earth even unto the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thy fathers hath known even wood and stone. And among these nations, you, Israel, shall find no ease, neither shall the sole of your foot have rest, but the Lord will give thee there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. And in verse 66, your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night and shall have none assurance of thy life. And they went into the land. And when they went into the land, they were in the land for around a thousand years. And when they were in the promised land, a thousand years later, these words of Deuteronomy 28, you'll be scattered among all nations. Your life will hang in the balance. You'll fear day and night. When they went into the land, a thousand years later, these words in Deuteronomy 28 began to take place. As the Babylonian Empire came down in 500 BC and took that nation, I'm going to pluck you up from the land whither you go. He said to Israel when they were there, I'm going to pluck you up from that land whither you go. A thousand years later, down came the Babylonians. They plucked up Israel and took them into captivity right back where Abraham began his journey. A total reverse because of their rebellion, because of their disobedience, because they spurned the love of God and the specialness that he placed upon them. A thousand years later and the Babylonians came down. While they were in Babylon as captives, Another prophet who was there as a captive with the Jews had these words to say. Here's another prophecy about this nation. Ezekiel 37. I'd just like you to come there for a few moments. Oh, they've been plucked off the land. They're now in captivity. They're now feeling the punishment and the, and the consequences and the results of the prophecy of Deuteronomy 28. And while they're in Babylon, they think that their hope is gone. They think, we've done it. That's it. God's turned his back on us. There's no promises. There's no great nation, as God said to Abraham. It's all gone. Our hope is lost. We're dried up. That's how they felt when they were in Babylon. But God comes to them through the prophet Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel chapter 37, this is what God says. Reading verses 1 through 2. Oh, this is an amazing chapter. Ezekiel 37, 
It's amazing. When you read through this chapter, we're not going to go all the way through the chapter. When you read it, Ezekiel is taken in vision into a valley, and the valley's full of dry bones. Dry, dead, desolate, gone. And Ezekiel looks at the bones. He's like, what's this? Are they going to live? And God says they will. And God tells us who this valley or these bones of this valley are. It's an amazing prophecy. There they are, Israel. They're in Babylon. Oh, we're finished. We turned our back on God. He's finished with us. No. God would not deny the promises that he made to Abraham. I will make of you a great nation. Well, here they are, punished, in captivity. And the, and the prophet Ezekiel comes, verse 1. And the hand of the Lord was upon me. That's Ezekiel. He's in Babylon with his fellow Jews, captives. And God carried me in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many of them in an open valley and they were very dry. And the question is, who are these bones? What's this about? Well, let the Bible explain itself. Look at verse 11 of Ezekiel 30. Who are these bones? Very dry. Many of them. Verse 11. Then God said to me, Ezekiel, Son of man, which was a title given to Ezekiel, these bones are the whole house of Israel. <gasps> oh, they say, our bones are dry. And they were. They were in Babylon. Thought they were finished with. They say, our bones are dry. Our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. And God says, no. Punished, yes. Totally destroyed, no. No. Because God made promises to Abraham that he would keep. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, an amazing prophecy. They say our hope is lost. Now that happened in 500 BC when the Babylonians come down. After 70 years, when Ezekiel received this prophecy, many of the Jews went back into their land again. So they're in Babylon, our hope is lost, Ezekiel gives them a prophecy, and 70 years later, they go back, many of them go back into the land. And then, when they went back into their land, 500 or so years later, these words of Deuteronomy 28 were going to be fulfilled. I want you to come back to Deuteronomy 28. The Babylonians began the process of punishment on Israel. Israel went back into the land and they still, after their captivity in Babylon, still continued, many of which, to turn against God. Well, even though they're now back again after 70 years, after having been taken into captivity, you come back to Deuteronomy 28 and you read these words. Ah, oh, there's more. There's more for Israel. There's more chilling prophecies for Israel. And in Deuteronomy 28, having already read about the Babylonian captivity, we come now and we pick up the record in Deuteronomy 28 and we read these words. This is now another prophecy of Israel. Verse 47. We looked at verse 63 through to verse 66 before. Now listen to these words. They're back, back in their land. We're moving closer and closer to the emergence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 47, Deuteronomy 28. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things, therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies which the Lord shall send against thee, and in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And God, one day down the track, way down the track, one day God is going to put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. Verse 49, the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar. This is not Babylon. Babylon's already come and gone. This is way after Babylon. God's going to bring a nation against thee from, from, from the far end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue you will not understand, a nation of fierce countenance. Here is a yoke of iron. And the iron is a biblical representation of Rome. As swift as the eagle flieth, Rome marched under the banner of the eagle. A nation whose tongue you were... They didn't understand the Latin tongue, did the Hebrews. 
So here now is not a prophecy of Babylon. Babylon's done its job. Babylon's taken them into captivity. Some of them have gone back and they're in the land for years and years and years and all of a sudden God says, way down the track, centuries after Babylon, another nation is going to come against you, the nation of Rome. And that happened, ladies and gentlemen, in AD 70. And I'm going to pick it up in a moment. The chilling words of the Lord Jesus Christ who picks up this prophecy of Deuteronomy 28 and reiterates it with much more detail and much more clarity so we are there in awe at the accuracy of Bible prophecy. So there we are. The Babylonians came, took them into captivity. Many went back. 500 or so years later, the Romans come in and scatter them throughout the ends of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, is Israel finished? When the Romans came in AD 70 and scattered Israel, Israel would wander, in the words of Deuteronomy, in fear, day and night. Their life would hang in the balance. Israel would wander for thousands of years, 2,000 years, after the Roman captivity and scattering of the Jews. So you could well, well ask, as Ezekiel asked in Ezekiel 37, when he saw the valley of dry bones, can these bones live? And God says, I made promises. You are mine. You are my witnesses. Isaiah 43. I made promises. Can they live? Oh, yes. So therefore, in Ezekiel 37, this valley of dry bones, God talks about, as Ezekiel's standing there, <laughs> you can see all these bones. And as he's watching the bones, they'll start rattling. They'll start rattling and they start coming together. And then sinews come on the bones. And then muscles and tissues. And then skin. The bones are not skeletons. They're, they're, they're bodies. And then God breathes into them. And they've got breath. And they, they, come to sh they come alive. So here is a, a national awakening of what appeared to be a totally dead, extinct nation. God says they're coming back. Even though I've scattered them, particularly with the Roman invasion in AD 70, even though I scatter them and punish them for their disbelief and rebellion, they are coming back. There is going to be a national resurrection. And do you know, I want you to come back very quickly to Ezekiel 37, just for a minute, this standing up of the nation. Babylonians started the ball rolling. The Romans in AD 70 totally cemented the punishment of this people where they were scattered and would not come back into their land not for 70 years as in the babylonian captivity for 2000 2000 years they'd be wandering without a land without a homeland ezekiel 37 verse 10 ezekiel says so i prophesied as god commanded me and the breath came into these bodies now and they lived and they stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. That is a national resurrection. Do you know, one day, subsequent to this nation coming back as a nation, one day there's going to be a king. Have a look at verse 21 of Ezekiel 37. Say unto Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone. I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. We have witnessed that in recent times. But what I can't wait to see is verse 22. And I will make them one nation in the land of Israel and one king shall be king unto them all. One king shall be king unto Israel. I want to talk about that in a few moments. Not for long, but I want to talk about that in a few moments. So this is a remarkable prophecy. They get to the Sinai Peninsula or the Sinai Desert and God says, you're going to go into the land, but I'm going to pluck you off. You're going to go into captivity with the Babylonians. You're going to come back. You're going to live there for a few hundred years and then you're going to be routed by the Romans in AD 70. And then you will live again after a scattering of 2,000 years. How did this miracle happen? What was the historical content of this prophecy after being scattered in AD 70? 
Have a look at this, ladies and gentlemen, about God working in the nations and the fulfilment of Bible prophecy. Remember the words of Ezekiel 37 and verse 21. I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and I'll bring them into their own land. AD 70 is come and gone. Israel were routed by the Romans and scattered. And then, 2,000 years later, or thereabouts, they'd come back to their own land. It started really, this movement of developing and getting the children of Israel back into their own land, in 1897, with this political movement of Zionism. And so here we have Theodore Herzl. And he wrote this book, Judenstadt, or The Jewish State. And it gives birth to a political Zionist movement. And this first Congress took place in 1897. What was it about? Well, the Jews had been wandering for nearly 2,000 years without a land, without a country, without a home. And this man was shocked by the intensity of anti-Jewish feeling. This man realised the Jewish people could not rely on the goodwill of the nations among whom they'd lived. The answer to the evils of anti-Semitism, which had gone on for hundreds, hundreds, if not thousands of years, the answer was a return to Zion. The answer was a return to the land. God says in Jeremiah, and chapter 16 and verse 12 through 16, they're going to come back. There's going to be a national resurrection. Bones that were dry are going to come back with flesh and sinew, tissue, breath. It's going to happen. How did it happen? God says, I'm going to send fishers to fish and lure the people of Israel back into the land. And he did. Here was the beginning of the fishers, fishing them back, enticing them back through this political movement of Zionism. And do you know, in order to accomplish a haven for the persecuted Jews, this man Herzl was even prepared to accept the offer of the British a territory in Uganda. We're going to have somewhere to live. We can't live in Europe and all over the world. We're being persecuted. We need some. So he's prepared, this man, to, to take up Uganda, the offer of the British. But this really led to a sharp conflict among the Zionists. But God says, no, the Jews are not going to live in Uganda. They're not going to live in Tasmania. They're not going to live in Texas. The Jews are coming back to the land, the land that Abraham came into. Therefore, God was at work. So more fishes are needed. The Zionist movement had its place. And here we are just on the cusp of the, or at the end of the Great War of 1914. And here we are in 1917. And God said, right, the Turks who occupied the land of Palestine, the Turks have got to go. The Turks have got to be driven out. And there were the Anzacs in Gallipoli, a disaster. They didn't get what they wanted. And God made sure that the disaster of Gallipoli would enforce and ensure that the Anzacs and the British would come down into Egypt. And then from Egypt, they'd come up and they'd drive the Turks out of Palestine, allowing the British to implement a mandate to allow the Jews to come back into their land. God was using now the British as fishers to bring the Jews back. And so there is General Allenby in 1917 and he comes in and they push the Turks out, paving the way unwittingly in God's prophecy for a, a place for Israel to dwell. Well, in the same year in 1917, here is the British now taking a very prominent position as fishers to bring back the land uh, of the Jews to their own land. I will send fishers, said God. Here's another one. This is the Balfour Declaration of 1917. And there's Lord Balfour, and this is what the British said. After the Turks had been routed and pushed out of Palestine. His Majesty's government views with favour now the establishment in Palestine. Not Uganda, not Tasmania, not Texas. Palestine. The British are fulfilling God's prophecies. We are in favour of establishing a, a homeland for the Jews a national home for the Jewish people. And we will use our best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this objective. Wonderful. God sending fishes. Oh, but there were storm clouds. There was something in the background that had not yet manifested itself. 
In 1924, even though the British had this mandate and they were encouraging Jewish immigration into the land of Palestine, in 1924, Hitler writes his book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle. And it was all about the main thesis, that Jews are a peril to the world. Hitler said the Jews are a peril, they've got to go. God says, no, they're my people, they're my witnesses. I have chosen them. Hitler said they're a peril. And so this book provides a curtain raiser, even though the British are now fishing them, even though Herzl has done his job in fishing them back, they're not coming back fast enough. Well, here we are. Here's a book that provides a curtain raiser to the cruelties and the utter inhumane persecutions which would result in the murder of six million Jews. Ah, oh, the Arabs feared that the events in Europe, which were now sweeping Europe, would cause them to become outnumbered in Palestine. The, the Arabs in Palestine can see this great influx of Jews coming in because they're fleeing this, this, this persecution that's starting a bubble in Europe. And the Arabs are one, worried that they're going to be outnumbered and therefore an armed conflict breaks out in Palestine, overarched by the British. The British can't have that. The British can't have the Arabs and the Jews in conflict. And therefore, what does the British do? They renege. They backflip on the Balfour Declaration. And therefore we have, in 1939, a white paper now that's issued by the British. And they recommend the cancellation of the mandate to be succeeded by an independent Palestine with an insurance of Jewish rights, yes, in a national home, pending which the Jewish immigration will be restricted. The British said, we're going to restrict them now. God says, you're going to come back. The British said, no, you're going to be restricted. Over a period of five years, and the Jewish land purchases would be narrow, narrowly restricted. God says, no. The Brits said, we're going to restrict the Jewish immigration. God says, no, they will not be restricted. My purpose will not be restricted. And after having sent fishers, Herzl, the Zionist movement, the British mandate, encouraging the Jews back, after the fishers were sent out, then God says, I'm going to send hunters. The Jews are not coming back. The Britain is standing in the way of allowing this people to come back as they should. Therefore, God says in Jeremiah 16 and 16, after the fishes, I'll send for many hunters and they'll hunt them from every mountain, the Jews, and from every hill and out of all the holes in the rocks. And Jeremiah says in chapter 30 and verse 11, I am with thee, says God to Israel. I'm going to save you. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered you, I will not make a full end of you. Oh yes, I'm going to hunt you out of the rocks and the holes. You're going to be persecuted. Yes, but God says to this nation, I am going to bring you back. I'm going to correct you in measure and I won't leave you altogether unpunished, but I'm not going to make a full end of Israel because I made promises that I will keep. What an amazing thing. And so, in 1948, after the fishers, after the hunters, after the enormous things that happened in Europe, in 1948, in fulfilment of Bible prophecy, after 2,000 years, after having been driven out in AD 70, in fulfilment of the words of Deuteronomy 28, I'm going to put a yoke of iron on your neck, I'm going to bring a nation against thee from afar, whose tongue you won't understand, as swift as the eagle flies, the Romans are coming in AD 70. And for 2,000 years they wandered and their life hung in the balance, according to Deuteronomy 28. But now God says you're coming back. And it happened in 1948. And here we are, May 14, 1948, by virtue of the natural and historic right of the Jewish people and of the resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, we hereby proclaim the establishment of the Jewish state in Palestine to be called the State of Israel. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, I will not make a full end of thee, O Israel. What an astounding thing. And there are the words of Ezekiel 36 and verses 22 to 24. Look at this, this last sentence. I will take you from among the heathen gather you out of all countries, fishers and hunters, doing their job, and I'll bring you into your own land. 1948. 
Now we've looked at what Moses the prophet said in Deuteronomy 28. We've looked at what Ezekiel said in Ezekiel 37 and Ezekiel 36. We've looked at what Jeremiah has said with respect, I will not make a full end of thee, O Israel. We've looked at three prophets. What about the greatest? The greatest prophet. The Lord Jesus Christ. What did he say about the nation of Israel? And the prophecy that he gave. And what Jesus does, he taps in to Moses in Deuteronomy 28. As swift as the eagle flies, a yoke of iron upon your neck, a nation whose tongue you will not understand. He picks up on the words of Deuteronomy 28, does Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ gives a prophecy that goes beyond what Moses gave and shows us we have got a book in our hands that is absolutely filled with graphic detail and accuracy. This is what Jesus Christ says about Israel, and particularly Jerusalem. Matthew 24, verses 1 through 2. Just a couple of things about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he says about this nation. And God says, you're mine, you're my witnesses. You are there to prove that this book is my word. Well, Matthew 24. And verses 1 through 2. Jesus is going to give what has come to be known as the Olivet Prophecy, a prophecy given by Jesus as he was on the Mount of Olives. Kidron Valley flowing down and there, over there, just there is the temple, Herod's temple. There it is there. And Jesus and the disciples can see that. So here's Jesus Christ in Matthew 24 and he's going to talk about that temple. He's going to talk about Israel. He's going to talk about a prophecy. Verses 1 and 2, Matthew 24. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, that temple there on the screen. And his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Look at this. This is wonderful. Look at it. Oh, granite. Beautiful. Jesus said in verse 2, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. That temple is going to be destroyed, said Jesus. When? 40 years from the time Jesus gave this prophecy. When was that? A.D. 70. That's the prophecy in Deuteronomy 28. A land, a, a nation that flies as swift as the eagle, a yoke of iron. This is Jesus reiterating with more detail the prophecy given by Moses in Deuteronomy and chapter 28. And Jesus says, you see that temple? There won't be one stone left standing upon another. Well, we'll just flick now into Luke 21 and pick up the flow of the story. See the temple, Jesus said? It's going to be totally and utterly destroyed, as it was in AD 70 by the Romans. Ah, but then you come to Luke 21, which is a parallel prophecy of Matthew 24, and we'll pick up some more detail about this story, about this prophecy. Luke 21 and verse 20. What is happening? This, this temple that's going to be thrown down and destroyed... Well, Luke 21 and verse 20. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies. Armies? That's Deuteronomy 28 verse 47. That's the yoke of iron. That's the Roman eagle. When you see Jerusalem encompassed, that's AD 70. That's when the temple is going to be destroyed. So there's a prophecy. And then the Lord Jesus Christ says this. In verse 24 of Luke 21. And they, the Jews, shall fall by the edge of the sword, shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Jesus is saying, you see that temple? It's going to be destroyed. When you see Jerusalem encompassed with the Roman army in AD 70, Know that the desolation spoken of in the Old Testament, all these prophecies about the destruction of this people and their scattering, which would be for 1,900 years, Jesus says, when these things begin to happen, Jerusalem is going to be trodden down of Gentiles. So Jerusalem is going to be trodden down of non-Jews for 1,900 years. One day, 
the times of the Gentiles would be fulfilled. Now, if you're old enough, you were alive to see the fulfilment of that promise, if you're old enough. Because the fulfilment of that prophecy wasn't 1948. It wasn't 1897 with Theodore Herzl. It wasn't 1948 when Jewish, the Jewish nation became a nation. We're now talking, when did Jerusalem, for the first time in 1900 years, come back into the hands of the Jews? When? In 1967. In the Six-Day War. Ladies and gentlemen, 1967... That's barely 20 years since Israel were established as a nation. 1948, they're all euphoric. We're now back at our homeland for the first time in 1900 years. And barely 20 years old is this nation. God says you're going to be there because I love you and I've made promises. Barely 20 years old is this nation and the Arabs are going to destroy it. This is what the president of Egypt, uh, of Egypt said in 1967. The armies of Egypt, Jordan, Syria and Lebanon are poised on the borders of Israel to face the challenge while standing behind us are the armies of Iraq, Algeria, Kuwait, Sudan and the whole of the Arab nations. This act will astound the world. And it did. I can remember watching television. I was about 16 years old. World War III. The world was arrested. God was at work. Jesus said Jerusalem would be trodden of the Gentiles. There would not be a Jewish rule in Jerusalem for 1,900 years. One day, the end of the Jewish at the Gentile age, and the Jews would have Jerusalem again, 1967. Oh, we're going we're to obliterate the Jews, said the Arabs. 20 years on from when they were established as a nation. God had, God had his promise to be fulfilled. So what happened? June the 5th, 1967, two days later, the Jews had taken the West Bank. They were going to be obliterated, surrounded on all sides by an army that totally outnumbered them. Two days later, the Jews took the Sinai Peninsula. A couple of days later, they took the Golan Heights. The world will be astounded, said President Nasser. God says the world will be astounded, not at Israel's defeat, but at Israel's victory. Jesus Christ prophesied this, the greatest prophet that ever lived. There they are in fulfilment of the words of Jesus Christ, Jerusalem would be back in the hands of the Jews. What an astounding nation. What an astounding prophecy. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ, in the context of the Jews being in their own land, in the context of Jerusalem being back in the hands of the Gentiles, Jesus Christ said, I'm coming. I'm coming. My return, my second coming is is." subsequent to these amazing prophecies of Israel. And Jesus says there will be signs in the sun, there will be signs in the moon, there will be signs in the stars, there will be signs upon the earth, there will be distress of nations with no way of escape. The sea and the waves would be roaring. That is right on the hills of Jesus saying, Jerusalem would be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And as soon as he says that, he said there's going to be signs of my coming. Now he's not talking about looking up at the sun and seeing it change shape or colour. He's not talking about the moon disappearing forever. He's not talking about the stars twinkling bright, different, different shades of purple. No. Jesus is talking about biblical language. Now, we're not going to turn it up because our time's almost gone. If you're taking notes, have a look at Deuteronomy 31, 28 and compare that with Deuteronomy 32, verse 1. Then, jot this down. Have a look at Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2 and 10. The Bible will tell you what the Bible means by sun, moon and stars. It's talking about political rulers and people, governments and people. So Jesus Christ is talking about the sea and the waves roaring. If you're taking notes, take a note of Isaiah 57 verse 20. The nations are like an angry sea, casting up mire and dirt. So the Bible uses the sea as nations. The Bible uses heavens as rulers. The Bible uses people as, as the people who are, are ruled over by those rulers. Jesus is saying, look at the governments of the day. Look at the people of the day. Look at the angriness of the nations of the day. All subsequent to these prophecies of Israel. I'm coming. Have a look at the world now, ladies and gentlemen, and tell me we live in a safe place. Tell me you are confident about what next week will bring with Russia, with Canada, with Paris, with London, with Sydney, with Melbourne. Tell me if you know what is going to happen next week. God does. And those that diligently search out his word as kings know 
that God is in control. Men's hearts, Jesus went on to say, subsequent to Israel, subsequent to Jerusalem being back in the hands of the Jews, men's hearts would fail them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the governments of this world will be shaken. What an amazing prophecy. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, God has a purpose. This world is embroiled in conflict, in violence, in hatred, in anger. God says the solution is this. One day, he, Jesus Christ, will judge among the nations and many people will be rebuked. And when Jesus Christ has returned, judging among the nations as the king, do you remember Ezekiel 37? They're coming back into their land and one king shall be king unto them all. He, as king, will judge among the people and when Jesus is in the world, they will beat their swords into plowshares. Tell that to Russia. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Can any government in this world guarantee that? The Bible can. And that's why we as Bible students absolutely rejoice in the fact that very soon our Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. Ladies and gentlemen, God says the destiny of this world is not destruction through violence, greed, fear. The kingdoms of this world one day will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever. How do we know that's going to happen? Because of all the prophecies that we have seen fulfilled absolutely to the letter. We have confidence that what yet is to come will come because Bible prophecy proves that this is God's word. Thank you.